Hello, gentle listener, and welcome to Nocturnal Transmissions, bronze medal winner, no less, in the Australian Podcast Awards 2020. No, stop it, stop it. It was an honor just to be nominated. But seriously, thank you, gentle listeners, for your support. In particular, our Patreon-subscribed listeners who get to listen to even more of our bronze standard content. Now, I simply must take a moment to thank our extraordinary featured authors whose contributions are the heart and soul of this humble podcast production. This award is as much yours as it is ours. Thank you for trusting us with your precious creations. Now, before we get to this week's precious creation, courtesy of horror scribe Brenda Kazar, a quick announcement. Nocturnal Transmissions is on. Instagram. This is the place where we announce upcoming episodes with accompanying audio teasers and share our nocturnal transmissions news. If you are not yet following us, we recommend you rectify the situation and remain in the dark no longer. You'll find a link on our website, nocturnaltransmissions.com.au. Or just jump on Instagram and search for Nocturnal Transmissions. We're not hard to find. All right, enough of that. Let's get to the good stuff. Our featured author this week is a horror, fantasy, and science fiction writer who hails from the dark tundra of North Dakota, where she cohabitates with her muse, Honey Boo Boo. A corgi of a most evil disposition. Let's see what her hairy little muse has inspired her to create for us, gentle listener. Nocturnal Transmissions is proud to present... Sal's Last Butcher Shop by Brenda. You can judge me if you want, but a man's got to do what a man's got to do. When the war broke out, I stayed in the old neighborhood. Where was I gonna go, anyway? I ain't never been nowhere else. Everything I've ever known is on these filthy, run-down streets. <laughs> Building a better future, my eye. Look what their better future mumbo-jumbo did. They made contact, all right. Only the aliens weren't no gentle freaks with glowing fingers, were they? Aliens won, I holed up in the shop while I figured out what my next move would be. While I was trying to figure it all out, a guy named Johnny ducked in the shop, trying to shake one of the alien squads. I took him in. <laughs> yeah, dumb move, I know, but it had been a long time since I'd had company. Johnny was a stinking drunk, but he was someone to talk to. Anyway, a couple of weeks went by without any problems, and I had Johnny mixing up some Cajun spices to blend into some chalk. Hey, we gotta eat, don't we? Might as well enjoy it. And I spent a lot of money on that inventory. No way I was gonna let it go to waste. But, uh, then a couple... 
couple of aliens stepped into the shop. You might have thought they were tourists stopping in to pick up chops or wings for a beach barbecue if it weren't for the fact they were seven feet tall and speckled green and black. God help me, I, I acted on instinct. One thing I've never lacked is a strong survival instinct. Johnny was standing at the end of the counter, closest to the aliens. I shoved him and ran. Of course, I didn't mean to shove him at them. I was just trying to get him out of my way. Well, that's what I tell myself anyway. So I can sleep at night. I really liked Johnny. Anyway, my luck being what it is, I panicked, ran the wrong way, and ended up in the goddamn freezer. It's an expensive freezer, but it ain't soundproof. I sat in there, freezing my nuts off and listening to Johnny scream while those... aliens... tore him apart. And I waited for them to come. For me. When the door swung open, I squeezed my eyes shut and waited for the end. Instead, claws hooked into my shirt and pulled me to my feet. I opened my eyes and let the alien lead me out to where Johnny, or what was left of Johnny, lay on the floor. The alien let go of my shirt and pointed at him. I looked at Johnny, then back at the alien. Was he trying to tell me that's how I was going to end up? Like it was some kind of mob shakedown, but with uh, space aliens instead of Guidos? The alien pointed at Johnny again, then at its mouth. And I don't like people screwing with me. Yeah, yeah, I get it, I said. You're going to eat me too. Just get it over with already. The other alien made some kind of gargling noise that almost sounded like a laugh. Like it thought me and the uh, other one, not understanding each other, was friggin' hilarious or something. Then it walked over to Johnny, squatted, and ran one claw across Johnny's filthy apron. It put its claw in its mouth and slurped. And then it started purring. <laughs> Purring? I mean, can you believe that? Who knew they could purr? Anyway, the alien went through it all again, claw across the apron and into its mouth, slurp and purr. I looked at where the alien had left two clean streaks across the gore on Johnny's apron, and then it dawned on me. It wasn't just gore. Johnny was drunk all the time. He had all the coordination of a peg-legged gorilla with palsy. I wouldn't let him cut or grind meat because I was afraid he was going to cut his arm off and <laughs> there ain't no doctors anymore. So I made him in charge of spices and seasonings. No sharp objects, you know. He was cool with it, but he always ended up covered in the stuff. And that's what the aliens were getting at. They liked the Spicy Johnny. They wanted more Spicy Johnny. <laughs> Cha-ching. I was back in business. At first, they brought in meat for me to cut and mix. I thought I had an iron stomach after all these years, but... It still took a lot of getting used to. These weren't dumb, cut-chewing animals I was cutting up. There were people. Worse still, there was a familiar face in the bunch every now and then. Old Eddie, who used to play chess in the park. Lou, the cop who was always good to walk a guy's drunk ass home instead of hauling him down to the station. Lola Parker, who we all used to drool over when she washed that little red sports car of hers, wearing nothing but a string bikini. 
We all prayed for the day those dental floss strings would give out and give us a glimpse of what they barely contained beneath those little triangles of fabric. I finally got to see her without the bikini. The day I turned her into Lola Cutlets. But it left me feeling flat. Really hurt to have to slice and dice folks from the old neighborhood. After a while, I had to start getting some meat ready myself. I had quite a few lucky loos with empty claws stopping in, and I didn't like the way they looked at me. I'd always hold up a spice can and shake my finger at them, and they'd get the message, Munch on Sal, and you'll have no more spicy meat. But I was worried how long it would last. I really didn't have any promise of protection from my regulars. Not like the good old days. At least I don't think I did anyway. That clattering pop-pop language of theirs is still Greek to me. Uh, to be on the safe side, I decided I'd better go out and round up some meat to have on hand. Oh, there was plenty of it, just laying around for the taking. Didn't matter that some of it was going over. The aliens liked their meat to touch rancid. That sickly sweet smell drives them crazy. But I uh, tried not to venture too far from the shop. After all, how would they know it was me, their friendly neighborhood butcher? All the aliens look alike to me, maybe we all look alike to them, too, so I tried to stick close to the neighborhood. And I always carried a shaker of spices, just to make sure they recognized me. A jar of Sal's secret human seasoning was my passport through the war zone, while I wandered the streets looking for my next daily special. I ran out of bodies in the old neighborhood after a while and had to go farther out. On that first trip out of the neighborhood, I was as nervous as a whore at the free clinic. I stopped at the old railroad bridge and tried to rustle up some nerve. My spice shaker clutched in my sweaty fist. I almost screamed when someone started sobbing. A young guy, about twenty, stepped out from behind the bushes near one of the trestles. He was missing an ear, and his face was smeared with blood. But he was alive. <laughs> I hadn't run into any live ones since Johnny. And neither had he, apparently. <laughs> he looked at me like I was a ghost. Uh, Yo, I said. Uh, what's up? <laughs> he started laughing and crying at the same time, and stumbled to me like a calf trying out its legs. Oh my god, he said. Am I ever glad to see you? Uh, he was a little scrawny, but he'd have to do. I told him I was glad to see him too, and it wasn't a lie. It just made my job easier. I threw my arm around him and told him he should come back to my shop where it was safe. He leaned into me and looked at me with big, trusting brown eyes. I wonder if that's what cows look like going to the slaughterhouse. Anyways, as we started back to my shop, I noticed some old pre-apocalypse graffiti on one of the track trestles, and it gave me an idea. After I'd taken the kid back to the shop, processed him, and put him up in the case, I went back to the trestle with a can of spray paint. Survivors, get to Sal's Butcher Shop, East Dominic and Third. Safe. Believe it or not, it worked. Suckers. I didn't have to leave for fresh meat anymore. They came to me. Can you believe it? I had so much spiced meat I should have had a half-price sale. But it would have been pointless. Those aliens got no appreciation for a bargain. It took me a while, but now they bring in bills when they shop. 
They still don't get the whole concept, but they're trying. One green bugger will pay me ten smackaroos for a spicy romp roast, and another will give me ten thousand dollars for a pound of spicy chuck. Or Ted, or whoever's on the menu. Anyway, it's all just pieces of paper to them. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're thinking. Sally boy, what the hell you need money for? <laughs> I ain't stupid. If I'm surviving, you can bet other people are surviving too. Someday the survivors just might join up and take back the world. If that happens, I'll be set for life. And if not, if the aliens are here to stay, well, got a good gig while it lasts. And you won't believe how good it is. Know who my biggest customer is? The big guy himself. That's right. The king of the aliens shops right here in my shop. <laughs> my shop. <laughs> you ever get any kings in here when you were running the place? Pops? <laughs> I didn't think so. You remember how pissed off you were when I lost my job at Delano's and Mom made you hire me? <laughs> you snarled around the shop like a junkyard dog, snapping and growling at everyone. Remember how, a year or so later, Ma got fed up with you working long hours and she made you retire and hand the shop over to me? <laughs> Do you remember what you said? You said I'd have the place run into the ground in five years. <laughs> you were wrong, Pops. So wrong. Everything turned out all right. Then the shop's more successful than ever. That's why I had to bring you here, Pops. Why well, I had to risk traveling all the way to the shore to see if you'd survived, so you could see how good I'd done for myself. You remember when you used to call me a cockroach, Pops? You said I was... What did you call it? Opportunistic. Opportunistic and impossible to get rid of, just like a roach. But you know what, Pops? Cockroaches are the ultimate survivors. And people always said cockroaches would be the only things around after the end of the world. So, I'll take it as a compliment now, Pops. No hard feelings. I'm just doing what a cockroach has got to do to survive. And I'll try and make it quick and painless for you. Pops. Sal's Last Butcher Shop by Brenda Kazar. If you'd like to find out more about this author, you'll find information and links to her work in the Featured Authors section of our website, nocturnaltransmissions.com.au. Next episode, we'll be featuring another story from the incredible Reggie Oliver. Mr. Oliver is the creator of Mr. Pigsney which we featured in episode 26, way back in April of 2018. That was a fun one. We are very excited to be sharing more of his simply wonderful writing with you, gentle listener. Those of you wise enough to be following us on Instagram will be receiving a little teaser for that one soon. Now, a big welcome to our newest Patreon acolytes. Gary Owen. Catherine Holt. 
Mr. B. And Jeff Sharp. I do believe you've rejoined us, Jeff. Welcome back. We're also very excited to announce that there is a new cohort in our midst. Yes, gentle listener, that most exalted of ranks, the very pinnacle of Patreon subscribers. These are the keepers of the dark flame we mention by name every episode as an act of appreciation for their big-hearted commitment to supporting our literary dark arts. Our new cohort is Chris Macaulay. Remember the name. Nocturnal Transmissions is not the only dark realm over which he holds sway. If you wish to become a Patreon subscriber and join the ranks of our aforementioned dignitaries, visit patreon.com forward slash nocturnal transmissions and subscribe as a minion, acolyte, or cohort. If you need more nocturnal transmissions in your life, a Patreon subscription will provide. Speaking of providing, that reminds me, it's time for another installment of Nocturnal Transmissions Recommends. The segment where we discuss matter of a dark nature that we have been enjoying and wish to share with you. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single podcast listener in possession of a good appreciation of horror content must also be in want of a good recommendation of cinematic horror entertainment. Or, as I think Jane Austen was trying to say, we horror listeners are, as a rule, also horror watchers. Oh dear, you're thinking. Here he goes, banging on about horror movies again. Au contraire, gentle listener. I am offering you the opportunity to hear someone else bang on about horror movies. Two people far more qualified to do so than this um, overly enthusiastic amateur. I'm talking about film critic Amy Nicholson and Paul Shear, hosts of the excellent Unspooled podcast, in which, over the course of 100 episodes, they dissect and discuss every single film on the AFI's Top 100 Films list. It's a first-rate podcast, gentle listener, well worth a listen, or 100 listens, for that matter. Anyway, now they are building their own list of movies, representing what they consider to be the best of the best, grouped into genre. And what genre did they turn their critical eye towards recently? Horror movies. They call this their Unghouled miniseries. Oh yes, I see what they did there. In this, they go into depth on their top five of what they consider to be the greatest examples of horror cinema in the history of moving pictures. The Thing. Oh yes, a most worthy inclusion. Night of the Living Dead. Well, how could they possibly leave that out? Ganja and Hess. You know, I haven't actually seen that one yet, but after their review, I certainly shall be seeking it out. The Babadook, a very worthy selection, and from Australia, no less. And Frankenstein. Yes, gentle listener, the original black and white Universal Pictures Frankenstein, upon which we opined at such great length in our Halloween special a few weeks back. Perhaps after listening to their expert reaction to this film, you'll understand why we have such a soft spot for this particular 
universal monster. So, search for Unspooled in your podcast app. Then find the Frankenstein episode, which kicks off their run of horror films. It was released on the 8th of October, just in case you have trouble finding it. They've chosen absolutely fantastic movies to discuss. I just know you're going to enjoy it. The Unspooled Podcasts Unghouled Miniseries Nocturnal Transmissions recommends it. This episode was brought to you with the generous assistance of our aforementioned Patreon subscribers. A particular thank you goes out to our esteemed cohorts. Michael Wood Evan Dooley, Sam Bell, Robert Troy Hampton Peterson, Alex Brewis, and Chris McCauley. All non-public domain stories are featured with the permission of the authors. All voices and production are concocted by Kristen Holland. Until next time. As always, watch the skies, fear the dark, and don't trust anyone, especially yourself. Good night, gentle.